This special news report will begin in 30 seconds. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23. Okay, that's getting annoying. It begins right now. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our special news report on the phylum arthropoda. I'm Tim Ryder. And I'm Travis Whitman. Also with us today is Sarah Georgievitz. She'll be reporting on location. She's got some cool facts about spiders. Spiders. Very cool. I don't know about you, but I had a couple of doozies in my bed last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ooh, okay. Anyway, the phylum arthropoda. It includes an incredibly diverse group of taxa such as insects, crustaceans, spiders, scorpions, and centipedes. There are far more species of arthropods than species in all other phyla combined. That's right. Did that mean we did more work than all of you? Ha <laughs> ha, not hardly. Mm -hmm. And the number of undescribed species in the largest assemblage of arthropods, the insects, probably numbers in the tens of millions. That's right, there are tens of millions of insects out there that we don't even know about. Kind of scary, isn't it? No. Members of the phylum have been <laughs> responsible for the most devastating plagues and famines mankind has ever known. Yes! Woo! Yeah! Giddy up. Yet other species of arthropods are essential for our existence, directly or indirectly, providing us with food, clothing, medicines, and protection from harmful organisms. The systematic relationships of arthropod groups is not fully understood, which is not surprising given the size and diversity of the phylum. So what we're talking about here is a scheme that's recommended by a lot of scientists that they've gathered over time, but they're still not sure because, well, they're old guys and they're scientists, and some of them don't know what the heck they're doing. They're old. They can't classify. They're just too old. Right on. Travis, why don't you take it from here? All righty, then. Well, basically arthropods consist of three subphylums. First of all, Chelicerata. They have the classes Mirostomata, horseshoe crabs, and uh, Eurypterids, I guess. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And then the class Pycnogenida, which are sea spiders. <laughs> spiders in the sea. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. And then the class Arachnida, which are spiders, ticks, and mites. I hate ticks. They're like vampires. Yes, <laughs> they are. I'm an idiot. And then the subphylum Crustacea, which have the classes Rometida, Cephalocarida, Branchiopoda, which are like fairy shrimp, water fleas, etc. And <laughs> fairy shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no. Maxillopoda, ostracods, copepods, and barnacles. And barnacles. <laughs> and then the class Malacostraca, isopods, amphipods, krill, crabs, shrimp, etc. And then we have, last but not least, the subphylum Euteramia, which have the class Chilopoda centipedes, and the class Diplopoda millipedes. And then we have millions and millions in the class Insecta. Like all insects, you know, it's just, it's really nasty. Lots and lots of them. Lots yeah. of insects. For more on the report, let's take it over to Sarah Georgevitz, who's got, once again, some awesome facts about spiders. Thanks, guys. The class Arachnida is a group of more than a thousand species, including spiders, scorpions, and mites. Particularly, spiders are the species we are going to be talking about today. When you meet a large spider unexpectedly, it is normal to catch your breath. For example, I am sure you have all heard the mother goose rhyme, Little Miss Muffet. There was no doubt that Miss Patience Muffet, probably the real Miss Muffet, suffered greatly because her father. Reverend Dr. Thomas Muffet had a fondness for spiders. He loved to encourage the house spider because, in his opinion, she doth beautify with her tapestries and hangings. 
Dr. Thomas Muffet was keen on treating his daughter with spiders to cure many alignments. No doubt the poor girl was horribly traumatized by spiders, and there was no surprise at all if, in fact, Miss Muffet went on to develop a full-blown case of arachnophobia. Arachnophobia, or fear of spiders, is a classic example of an animal phobia. It, is an afflict, it can afflict anybody, even the toughest, the most macho men. Spiders range in length from less than 0.5 millimeters to 9 centimeters in some tropical tarantula species. With their hairy bodies and long legs, spiders provoke both fear and fascination. Like an insect, a spider has jointed legs and has a hard body case or carous face. Their bodies are divided into two parts separated by a slender waist and they have eight legs rather than six. Although most, most spiders have eight, eight eyes in two rows, their vision is poor. Some spiders have such bad eyesight that they cannot find an insect in front of them. But when the insect moves, the spider will immediately sense the vibrations it creates and pounce with deadly accuracy. Spiders do not have antenna or wings, but, are but have powerful jaws that deliver a poisonous bite. All spiders are predators. Some eat frogs, lizards, and even small birds, but most feed on insects. A spider uses its poisonous fluid or venom to paralyze its prey, then injects it with digestive juices to dissolve the prey's tissue. The giant fangs on some spiders stab downward, pinning, the pinning to the ground. Other spiders have fangs that come together when they bite. Silk is a remarkable substance made by spiders. For spiders, the most important use of silk is making webs. Once a web is complete, spiders usually fly in wait, either on the web itself or close enough to the, touch it with its legs. If anything makes the web vibrate, the spider instantly rushes out to investigate. Then the spider often wraps up the victim with sticky threads before delivering a healthy bite. Not all spiders catch their prey by webs. Many use traps, while others set off patrol and pounce on anything that can make a meal. Camouflage crab spiders keep still as they lurk among flowers with their front legs wide open. If a meal such as a honeybee lands within range, they strike instantly. Spiders are terrestrial and have a unique respiratory system. Spiders breathe through openings in the cuticle called spiracles. Air passes through the spiracles to the book lungs. The book lungs are paired sacs in the abdomen with page-like components with a, that provide a large area for gas exchange. The excretory system is modified for life on land. The malpighian tubes are the main organs in the excretory system. They are hollow projections of digestive tac that collect body fluids, remove waste, and carry waste to the intestines. Some spiders have coxal glands, organs that move waste and discharge them through an opening at the base of the leg. <coughs> in reproduction, the male spider gathers sperm and sacs in the tips of the pedipalps, then places the sperm to the seminal, seminal receptacle of a female. Later, the female lays eggs that are fertilized by the stored sperm as they pass through the genital pore. Then the female steals the egg, seals the egg in a case of silk, where the young spiders go through their first mole inside the case. Just before it starts to mole, a spider hangs upside down and secures itself with a sick silk thread. Its skin splits around the sides of the cephalothorax and abdomen and starts to fall away. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the spider pulls its legs out of the old skin. When the body is free, it hangs from the thread and expands to its new size. Back over to Travis with more interesting facts on crayfish. Thank you. Huh. Can't do this anymore, man. What's wrong? I've got a huge headache. Oh, here. Take two of these. Ah, uh, Tylenol. Little, yellow, and red. Different. Yeah, takes away the pain. Sarah, good job, Sarah. Giddy up. Well, anyway, once again, I'm 
I'm Travis Whitman, and I'm here to show you a little bit of information about the crayfish, similar to the lobster. Also, the crayfish is either called the crawdad or the crawfish, whichever you prefer. There are about 500 species of crayfish in North America, so they're a pretty thick population. First of all, some scientific things about the crayfish. First of all, they belong to the subphylum Crustacea. Crayfish are a part of the order Decapoda, constituting the families Astastidae or Paraastacidae. The common genera of North America is Astacus, Astacus, and the species name is Potombumbius, Philippis. It's kind of hard to say there, but uh, I think I got it. Well, anyhow, nearly all crayfish live in freshwater, although some can survive in salt water, which is a pretty good thing. They are characterized by a head, a thorax, covered with a single shell, or carapace, which ends in front of the, a sharp pointed rostrum. Its eyes are compound and stalked. On its head are a pair of antennules, which are richly supplied with sense organs, and a pair of long antenna, which are organs of touch. These have excretory organs at the base. The crayfish have a pair of strong jaws and two pairs of smaller accessory jaws, the maxillae. The second pair of maxillae drives water over 20 pairs of feathery gills on the basis of the thoracic limbs. On the thorax there are three pairs of appendages which are used to pass food to the jaws, a pair of stout pincers, ouch, it can hurt if they pinch you and four pairs of legs, which the crayfish use to walk forward. The abdomen is divided into seven segments, wow, and has five pairs of limbs on its underside. The first pair are grooved in the males and are used to introduce sperm onto the female. The other four are swimmerettes. The crayfish can swim speedily backwards in forward flicks of its abdomen, which ends in a fan-shaped tail. It does this to escape. Isn't that cool? Crayfish have a hard outside skeleton. This jointed exoskeleton provides protection and allows movement but limits growth. This causes the crayfish to outgrow a skeleton and molt, if you will, or shed its exoskeleton. This occurs six and ten times during the first year of growth. For a few days following this molt, the crayfish are quite soft and lose a lot of the protection, which is kind of like walking around naked, you know, and much more vulnerable to its predators, so, you know, it's kind of dangerous. Well, anyway, back to feeding. The crayfish trap food with their chelipeds, tear it with the maxillae and maxillopeds, and chew it with the mandibles. The food then passes through the esophagus to the stomach, with where chitinous teeth grind into a fine paste, yummy, into a fine paste that is mixed with digestive juices. I didn't see. Digestive glands absorb the mixture, and undigested particles pass through the intestines and out the anus. Excretory organs, called green glands, remove waste from the blood and retain salts, which are scarce in fresh water. Uh-oh. Circulatory and respiratory systems. The crayfish has an open circulatory system. Blood flows from a dorsal sinus through small one-way valves called ostia into the dorsal heart. The heart then pumps the blood into seven large vessels that carry it through the body. Blood leaves the vessels and fills the body cavity where it bathes the organs and cells. That means they clean them. Blood collects in a large ventral sinus other vessels that carry the blood through the gills where it gives off carbon dioxide and takes up oxygen gas. It then returns to the dorsal sinus. Gills are attached to each walking leg, protected in a chamber under the carapace. As the crayfish walks, water moves across the gills. Also, as the second maxillae move during feeding, the two gill balers attached to them bail water over the gills. Pretty cool, huh? Now some facts about the nervous system. Cool. The crayfish nervous system includes a brain 
and a ventral nerve cord that runs from the brain to the tail. Nerve impulses travel to and from the nerve cord through ganglia. Nerves connect the brain with sense receptors in the antennules, antenna, and eyes. The eyes are set on two short movable stalks. Each eye has more than 2,000 light sensitive lens. Eyes with many lenses, or compound eyes, giddy up, are highly sensitive to light and detect motion well, even though they can form only very crude images, not so giddy up. A crustacean senses position through the use of statocysts. Statocysts are cells that contain particles of calcium carbonate, which move when the crustacean's uh, position changes. They, this movement is monitored by the nerves and interpreted by the brain. More cool facts. Now a little bit on the reproduction of the crayfish. Well, first of all, the crayfish only lives about two years. You know, that's got to stink. Therefore, rapid high volume reproduction is important for the continuation of the species. Many crayfish become sexually mature and mate in October or November after they are born. But fertilization and egg laying usually occurs following the spring. The fertilized eggs are attached to the female swimmerettes on the underside of her jointed abdomen. There are oh, t 10 to 800 eggs that change from dark to translucent as they develop. The eggs hatch in 2 to 20 weeks depending on water temperature. You know, if it's cold, then that's got to stink. Maybe not as quick. And, no. The newly hatched crayfish stay attached to their mother until shortly after the second molt. Pretty cool, huh? Well, now I got a pretty decent... I so got the weather to do a little dance and a little love. Get down to that. <laughs> okay. Well, as you can see here, Look at all these baby crayfish, you know, if you wonder why there's so many species in North America, that pretty much answers your question. Once again, 10 to 800 eggs. Now that I've told you about the basic outline of the crayfish, let me show you just a few external features of the crayfish. First of all, right here are the antennules, and then the antenna, which surround the antennules. And then also there's the rostrum, which I mentioned earlier. Let's see, the eyes are right here. These are the compound eyes and the ones that are on the stalks. Let's see, this here is the mandible. And also number eight right there is the mouth. And basically, you know, these are your basic walking legs and these are the swimmerettes. This is what can be very painful to some prey. You know, I mean, that just gotta hurt. I mean, these can pinch pretty hard. That's basically how they catch their prey. This is, well, this is the inside look at the jointed abdomen. As I said earlier, seven segments. Now, the crayfish are not invincible. They definitely have their predators and can probably get killed pretty easily. Predators of the crayfish include alligators and real bullies, jerks. I hate alligators. And burbots, a type of cod. You know, cod are bullies too. And the chicken turtle. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a chicken turtle? <laughs> and the desmond, a type of otter. And a graggle, a type of bird. Well, that's basically all the information I have about the crayfish. But stick around. After these messages, Tim Ryder will be along with some awesome hints on the scorpion. So, Take it easy. What is that? Oh my gosh, go! Go! go. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I cut. Okay, yeah, cut. Let's do that one again, huh? <laughs> that tree was not there just a second ago, I it, swear. It's toward the end of the movie, whenever you die, that's when you get hit. Right, right. That's a little early. Oh my gosh, okay. Man, I bet Mark McGuire is going to break the home run record again this year. And I'm not going to see it because I'm going to be stuck in the woods. Well, that's, uh, quite, you know, that's, that's good acting, but Mark McGuire doesn't break the record until 97. Oh, right. This is supposed to be 1994. Yeah. 
three years ago. And right. Kinda... None of that has even happened yet. Okay, my bad. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> hey, Heather, check this river out. You thought the last one was bad. Look at this. It's a doozy. Oh, look at that water you're going to have to cross. <laughs> well, wait um, what? Look what's across it. I don't think that's Holy. Supposed to be here. Uh, are we supposed to see those? <laughs> I, think we should, I think we should do this one over. Uh, have we gone too far? Okay. Uh, uh, let's turn around. <laughs> I would like to apologize for everything that has happened. I would like to say I'm sorry to my mom and Heather's mom. And Josh's mom? Uh, dude, wait. What? You're Josh, remember? Dude, shut up, I'm filming! <laughs> Maybe you should do that one over again. <laughs> I'm, jo I'm Josh? Yeah, you're, you're Josh. And you're Mike? Yes, I'm Mike. It's the Blair Witch Blooper Tape, twelve ninety five or less in any store sold. Makes a great Christmas gift. Do you Travis, wherever you are? You ever notice that even though he turned it over to me, we never actually moved? Kind of weird, huh? Anyway, how you guys doing today? I'm Tim Ryder, and I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> or am I bluffing? You don't know, so I guess you'll have to stay in the dark. Anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the wonderful world of scorpions. Scorpions are a very interesting group of animals. I discovered this as I was researching. For example, they glow. Did you know that? I bet you didn't. Yes, when placed underneath an ultraviolet light, scorpions glow, or as we say in the scientific world, they fluoresce. This makes it very easily makes it very easy for scientists to capture them. They just walk around with a big ultraviolet light at night and look for the glowing things. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how they're classified. Of course, they're under the kingdom Animalia because they're animals. And then, under the phylum Arthropoda, the class Arachnida, the order Scorp Scorpiones, or Scorpionida. Their habitat includes all major land masses except Greenland and Ar and Antarctica. And when you think about it, what really lives in Greenland and Antarctica? Nothing. So it's pretty much safe to say they're everywhere. And a little side note, they're accidentally introduced into New Zealand and England. Accidentally. That must kind of stink for those people that live there. They range from up from Canada and Central Europe to the tips of South America and Africa. They've radiated into all non-boreal habitats including deserts, savannas, grasslands, and temperate tropical and rainforests. That's right, scorpions, not just desert animals anymore. Let's talk a little bit about their form. Their anatomy has changed very little since the Paleozoic era. Consequently, they have a very primitive body plan. What the scorpions that you're seeing today are very similar, similar to the scorpions that you would have seen many millions of years ago. All right, to help you out with their form, i got a little diagram here I'm going to show you. They have more segments, they have 18 of them, than any other arachnids. They're divided into two, sec two major sections. From the top up here is the prosoma. From right here on down is what we call the opisthosoma. At the top here, they have what's called pedi palps or pinchers, used for prey capture, defense, courtship, and burrowing. Their legs here extend in tar they end in tarsal claws that grasp the surface when walking. They have one medial and from zero to five eyes in their head right up here. And of course, then they have the tail and the vicious stinger. Their entire exoskeleton is composed of chitin, which is very hard. It's like an armor. They're like an impenetrable army type guy thing. Okay. Good. Let's talk a little bit about what's on the inside. They perceive the world through visual, tactile, and chemical sense organs. Their eyes cannot form sharp images. Bummer. However, they are very sensitive to light. So sensitive, in fact, that they are among the most sensitive in the entire animal kingdom. So, so sensitive, extremely sensitive, that they can navigate at night using shadows cast by starlight. Starlight, can you do that? I think not. They can interpret by
vibrations in the air and ground. Hairs called trichobothria detect air movement, which they use to catch aerial prey, detect predators, and navigate using prevailing winds. Sense organs detect ground vibrations produced by prey, potential predators, and mates. It'd be like us putting our ear to the railway uh, track thing and trying to see if a train's coming, only a lot more sensitive. Their excretory system is extremely efficient, expels very little water. Some scorpions live indefinitely without drinking any water. None. Sufficient water is contained in food or is produced internally from food as water from metabolism. Okay, let's get down to business now and talk a little bit about their reproduction and life cycle. This is where it just gets pretty freaky. They have very few sexual differences. Males are usually more slender and have longer tails. However, they have evolved mating behaviors that prevent eggs and spermatozoa from drying out. Breeding season occurs during warm months. Males become vagrant and travel hundreds of meters to find a mate. Males find females by local, localizing a pheromone that the female emits. A pheromone that's like a chemical smell type deal thing. They have a complicated and characteristic courtship. I'm going to do a little demonstration here for you, so I'm going to need some space. Um, it's initiated by the male who faces the female. Okay. Imagine that this hand is like a male scorpion. And this hand is like a female. So they're walking along, they're walking along. Ooh. They see each other. They like what they see. So the male faces and then grabs her with his peaty pouts. He latches on with his pictures and holds on for dear life. Nothing is going to separate him from this beautiful looking scorpion chick they just found. And here, check this out. Then they do a little dance. They go sideways and up and back and back and forth in a courtship dance called the promenade et dieu. This it's because the male is trying to position his spermatophore over the female's opercula. In our language, it's because the male is trying to get his groove on. Once that happens, spermatozoa is ejected into the genital opening of the female, and the rest is history. A little uh, bummer of a side note, males that remain near females after mating sometimes are killed and eaten by them which always seems to put a damper on the evening, no matter how it goes. Unlike almost all other animals except mammals, scorpions are what we call viviparous, which embryos nourished in utero by the mother. After fertilization, eggs are retained in the female's body for periods varying from several months to a year before the young are born alive. And birth lasts from several hours to several days, which has to stink for the female. That's got to be quite a lot of pain. We can't hear them complain, so who cares? All right, on to their food and feeding. This is just weird, too. They're what we call opportunistic predators. They eat pretty much any small animal they can capture. Common prey includes insects, spiders, other arachnids, and often other scorpions. That's right, they're cannibals. Less common prey, however, includes terrestrial isopods, snails, and small vertebrates like lizards, snakes, and rodents. They're largely nocturnal and hide in burrows, natural cracks, or under rocks and bark. And then, once night comes, they're sit and wait predators. They remain motionless until a suitable prey moves into an ambush zone. Kind of wussy just sitting around and waiting for the food to come to you, but I guess it works. They can feel the vibrations of airborne and ground walking prey. They're detected. These detections are sophisticated enough that scorpions can determine the precise distance and direction of their prey. Just from their vibrations, they can tell exactly where they are. Once the prey is detected, the scorpion orients, runs to the prey, and grabs on. The prey is stung if it is relatively large, aggressive, or active. Otherwise, it is simply held in the peaty palps while it was eaten. The scorpions lack conventional jaws, and their eating habits are very unusual. A pair of tooth pincer-like appendages and sharp edges of adjacent jaw-like structures macerate the prey. I don't know exactly what that word means. But all I know is that I wouldn't want to be macerated. They are, the prey is macerated as quantities of digestive fluid secreted from the small intestine pour over it. The victim's soft parts are broken down, liquefied, and sucked into the scorpion's stomach by a pumping action. The victim is gradually reduced to a ball of indigestible material, which is cast aside. 
Eating is a slow process, often taking many hours, which has just got to be bad for the prey, sitting there while it's digested, still alive. Scorpions are extremely efficient eating machines. They can increase their body weight by one-third when feeding. Their metabolic rates and energy needs are low, ten times lower than that of insects. They are also extremely efficient at transferring energy from prey tissue to their own. These factors, plus an efficient food storage organ, combine to, to allow scorpions to live up to 12 months without eating. A whole year without anything to eat. It is possible that scorpions only feed from 5 to 50 times a year. Must be nice. Let's talk a little bit about the associations of scorpions. Some of their predators include birds, mostly owls, lizards, a few small snakes, mammals, some rodents and carnivores, and frogs and toads. Both scorpion cannibalism and predation on other species is frequent. A few large arthropods, such as spiders, sulpugids, centipedes, also eat scorpions. The vast majority of scorpions are non-social, interacting only at birth, courtship, or cannibalism. They are often aggressive towards other scorpions. However, a few do exhibit social behavior. Some form overwintering aggregations with individuals of their own species, usually under bark or in fall fallen trees. A few extend the mother-offspring association for weeks to months or even years. In one species, the offspring may remain with the family group even as adults, and some family groups cooperate in prey capture. All right, now how they defend these cells from their predators. Of course, the stinger and venom are the scorpion's primary defense against predators. The venom has a dual function. One of its chemical components is directed at arthropods, which is its prey capture, and one at vertebrates, which is its predator deterrence. An injection of potent neurotoxin is an, is an overkill for most, most insects. Nocturnal activity and the low levels of surface activity may have evolved to avoid predation pretty smart. If you don't want to get eaten, don't go out much at all, and when you do go out, go out at night. Smart creatures, these scorpions. Many predators exhibit typical behaviors that enable them to handle scorpions safely. Most vertebrate predators bite or break off the scorpion's tail and stinger. Ouch. Some vertebrates and arthropods are immune to scorpion venom, even from those species that are lethal to humans. Speaking of being lethal to humans, this is what you got to worry about. About 25 species in eight genera possess potent venoms capable of killing humans. With the exception of snakes and bees, scorpions cause more deaths than any other non-parasitic group of animals. More than 5,000 people are thought to die each year from scorpion stings. The venoms of more than 1,200 other species are not deadly. These species produce hemotoxins that cause mild to strong local effects, including edema, discoloration, and pain. The sting, however, is often far less painful than that of a bee. Victims fully recover in minutes or in a matter of days. Okay, now I know you guys, you're just sitting there thinking, yeah, all this stuff is nice, but what does it have to do with me? Why should I care about scorpions? How about this? Scorpion venom might cure brain cancer. Brain cancer, that's right. In a report released from Dr. Harold Sunthimer of the University of Alabama said he and his colleagues has isolated a substance from the venom that seems to act uniquely against brain cancer cells. If the findings translate to humans, something that will take years to test, the toxin could offer the first real treatment for the deadly brain cancer known as glioma, which kills 18,000 Americans a year. So be nice to scorpions, because you know what? They could cure brain cancer one day. You could have brain cancer, and then you'd have a scorpion to thank, wouldn't you? On the other hand, you could get killed by a scorpion, and that wouldn't be very fun either. Okay, that about does it for me. We're going to take a short break right here and be back with your pop quiz. Stay tuned. Is it? It's almost four. What time is she supposed to be here? I don't know. We, we met here at 3.30. Did that time she was supposed to be here? Didn't you call her? I was supposed to call her? I thought you were going to call her. I thought... That's... This is not good. That's great, Travis. Right. We can't start until she gets here. Ooh, I'm sorry. I'll go call her. Yeah, right. please do. Is it going to take her long to get here? She I gotta in, go. She lives in St. Louis, about what? 50 minutes away. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, what's her number? I don't know. Look it up. Oh, great. 
not going anywhere for a while, just grab a Snickers. Because nothing gets your hunger better. Hungry? Why wait? Everybody, welcome back. It's time for your pop quiz. I hope you've been paying attention because your question today is how long can scorpions go without eating? Is it A, three weeks, B, eight months, C, 12 months, or D, their whole lives? You have until I finish my little song. Do, 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 do. your choice. I hope you're shouting it at the screen. I hope you're shouting it to all your other classmates so they can know how smart you are. And I hope you're shouting out answer C because that was the correct answer. 12 months. Okay, everybody, that's all the time we have for today. I hope you've enjoyed our little report. I hope you've learned something. All right, so that's all we have. So uh, if I don't see you again, well, goodbye. <laughs>